Good afternoon. Sorry to be a few minutes late. My fault. Uh, we have a, a lot of ground to cover today, uh, and uh, we have a uh, video call with the White House after this, so we're going to go as fast as we can. But as I said, there's a lot of ground to cover. Dan, tomorrow we are on for 1 p.m., and uh, unless you all hear otherwise, and Saturday as well at 1 p.m. Uh, and from here in each case, and if we we will do electronic notification as it relates to the overnight data and uh, realities on Sunday, unless we think, the group of us think it is meaningful to meet even by telephone, in which case we'll let you know. I'm joined uh, today by the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, a guy who's uh, slowly creeping into that same category. Uh, also from the Department of Health Com Communicable Disease Service Medical Director, Dr. Ed Lifshitz. Thank you both for being here. And to my left, a, a guy, another one who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. So we'll get right to the numbers if we can. Today we are reporting an additional 4,391 positive cases, positive test results rather, and for a total of 75,317 New Jerseyans who have now tested positive. According to our online dashboard, again accessible through covid19.nj.gov, as of 10 p.m. last evening, uh, yes, 10 p.m. last night, 8,224 residents were reported hospitalized. Judy, I got that right, I hope. Of whom 1,880 were listed in critical or intensive care, and 1,645 ventilators were in use. 46 patients are at one of our field medical stations, and between 10 p.m. Tuesday and 10 p.m. last night, happy to say 802 residents were discharged from our hospitals. As I announced yesterday, the daily reports from our three veterans' homes have also now been added to the online dashboard. Uh, and as and Judy will get into more color on all of the above. And as we note every day, all of these numbers are just a snapshot in time. Overnight changes or late reports may not yet be reflected in the posted data. Sadly, with the heaviest of hearts, we also have the duty to report the loss of another 362 New Jerseyans, 362 blessed members of our state and our community due to COVID-19 related complications. Our statewide toll now sits at 3,000. 518, and that is now officially more than the lives lost from fellow New Jerseyans in the First World War in total. God bless their souls, each and every single one of them. Here are three stories of those we have lost recently. First up, Michael Burke. Let's get Michael up there. God bless him. Look at that guy. Born in Patterson, but for the entirety of his life, he called nearby Little Falls home. And he devoted much of that life to his hometown. Mike was a volunteer firefighter, a 48-year member of the Singac Fire Company Number 3. And for 26 of those years, he served as the company's president. He also served for 14 years as president of the Little Falls Fire Department. When he wasn't at the firehouse or out fighting fires or tending to emergencies. His day job was as vice president of Tritech Design Inc. in Little Falls. To his son Tyler, with whom I spoke earlier, and his fiance Kathy, and the entire Little Falls community, Mayor James Damiano reached out as well. We are with you all in mourning Mike's passing and his blessed life. We also lost Solomon David. There he is, God love him. By the way, lost at the, at the tender age of 41. He was an EMT with Trinitas Regional Medical Center in Elizabeth for nine years. He also worked at St. Barnabas Medical Center as a hyperbaric safety officer in the, wounded, in the wound care center. But his most important jobs were as husband to his wife, Renee. And again, I spoke to Renee earlier today. God bless her and father to their children, soul and journey. Solomon was a basketball coach for the North Plainfield Nothing But Nets organization. He was also a businessman, the owner of his own clothing company, Soulful Journey Brand. And it's hard not to see where he got that name. Helping people was his true calling, and I know his family and community will miss that the most. 
May God bless him and each and every one of his family and friends. 75 years ago yesterday, on April 15th, 1945, the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp was liberated by British forces. One of those freed that day was Margaret Feldman. There she is. Margaret passed away from COVID-19 complications on Tuesday, April 14th. She was just about two months shy of her 91st birthday. She was born Margaret Buchhalter in Budapest and grew up in a small town near the border with Czechoslovakia. When the Nazis came, she and her parents were sent to Auschwitz. Her parents were murdered there, but she lied about her age, telling the soldiers that she was 18 and not 15, making her eligible to serve forced labor. She would survive being sent to several camps including one return trip to Auschwitz and a death march to Bergen-Belsen. She was still just 16 and a survivor at her liberation. She would soon move to Sweden and came to the United States in 1947 upon discovering an aunt and uncle who had moved here. Margaret would become an x-ray technician and in 1953 married Harvey Feldman, with whom she would raise a family. Their son, Joseph, himself, by the way, a medical doctor working in East Orange, and I spoke to him earlier today, and daughter, Tina. And she and Harvey would see their children marry and give them three grandchildren. Harvey, her husband, it should be noted, is currently in Morristown Medical Center, also with COVID-19. Please, everybody, keep him in your prayers. Margaret was active in her synagogue and with the Jewish Federation of Somerset, Hunterdon, in Warren counties, among other organizations. But Margaret's legacy is best captured in her work to ensure that the world never forgets the horrors of the Holocaust. She would share her story of survival and liberation with tens of thousands of students across the state and served as a founding member of both the New Jersey Holocaust Education Commission and the Holocaust and Genocide Institute at Raritan Valley Community College. For her, I recall the words of the great Elie Wiesel, and I quote him, just as despair can come to one only from other human beings, hope too can be given to one only by other human beings. Margaret gave us so much hope over her 90 plus years. She will be buried tomorrow, two days after the 75th anniversary of her liberation. May her memory be a blessing to her family, and to us all. Three remarkable lives of three remarkable New Jerseyans. Each gave so much to their communities and for every single one of them. Those we have just lost and those we have lost over the past number of weeks. We take a moment to remember and we look to our flags flying at half staff. This is the ultimate toll of COVID-19. All of a sudden, social distancing doesn't seem so much of an inconvenience if it means that we don't have to keep mourning so many blessed souls. It remains the key to us flattening the curve and eventually coming down the other side of it to the point where we can responsibly begin the process of reopening our state. I've been showing, Dan, help me out here, I've been showing this map every day and I want us all to see it again. Our efforts, folks, are working. We're not home yet by any means, but our efforts are working. Over the past few weeks, we've taken a map that was once red and bright orange, and we're turning it lighter and lighter, and that's good news. It means that we're aggressively slowing the transmission of COVID-19. But if we let up even just a bit, we will, we will risk seeing these colors rapidly turning to bright orange and please God, not again to red. And again, the colors determine how fast the spread is doubling. This is our challenge together. Our goals are twofold, to flatten the curve and bend it back down. We cannot have a spike. That would be potentially disastrous for our healthcare system and its workers, and it would meet countless more deaths 
3,518 is already 3,518 too many. And we know we're going to lose more of our blessed residents. But how many more depends on you and we maintaining our practice of social distancing, of staying at home. Please continue to do just that. It is working, notwithstanding the loss of these blessed lives. It is working. And together we will break the back of the curve, the virus, bring it down as far as we can, as close to zero, and begin responsibly get back in our, to get back on our feet. It is in this vein that today I'm announcing that our public schools will remain closed through at least Friday, May 15th, another four weeks. I've made this decision in careful consult consultation with Judy in the Department of Health, as well as Dr. Repolette in the Department of Education, among other key stakeholders. Let me be perfectly clear. There's nobody who wants to open the schools more than I do. I'm a father of four kids, one of whom is in high school, and I want him to return to his regular classrooms. But I can't do that right now. But I remain hopeful we can. We cannot be guided by emotion. We need to be guided by where the facts on the ground, science, and public health take us. And that means it will not be safe to reopen our schools or start sports back up for at least another four weeks. I know this is hard. It's hard on all of us. I've got a senior in college, his graduation ceremonies have been canceled. It, it, it's hard. But if we all keep pulling and working together, I hope that it will put me in a position in a month's time to make a different announcement. There is no doubt we are saving lives and we must maintain the course. Now, please allow me to switch gears to a couple of separate topics. I will first address the heavy news that came out last night regarding a long-term care facility in Sussex County. I am heartbroken by the tragic news that several individuals have lost their lives in a coronavirus outbreak at the Andover Subacute and Rehabilitation Center 1 and 2, and pray for the health and recovery of the other residents and employees devastated by COVID-19. I am also outraged that bodies of the dead were allowed to pile up in a makeshift morgue at the facility. New Jerseyans living in our long-term care facilities deserve to be cared for with respect, compassion, and dignity. We can and must do better. I've asked the Attorney General to look into this matter as well as to do a review of all long-term care facilities that have experienced a disproportionate number of deaths during the COVID outbreak, and I know he will take any and all appropriate action. Our full focus must remain on mitigating the spread of the virus and minimizing the impact to all who remain, in this case at the Andover facility, as well as all of our other long-term care facilities. Commissioner Persa Kelly, and she'll get into this I'm sure, has also directed the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service with Ed in coordination with their team, in coordination with the local health department to enforce critical safety measures and protocols. A team has been deployed to assist the center, its staff, and its residents. We know this is an issue that is not unique to New Jersey. It is national in, in scope. We know that there are bad actors in the industry across the country but New Jersey can lead in how we respond to these issues. Switching gears to another topic, I want to express publicly, as I do privately on a regular basis, my deepest gratitude to Governor Andrew Cuomo for the 100 ventilators that New York is sending to New Jersey to help with our efforts. New York and New Jersey have been partners throughout this emergency and this partnership is focused on saving lives and working together to beat this virus. Neighbors look out for each other. And to Governor Cuomo, again, thank you. And we will return the favor. Also today, I am announcing the, my appointments of Dr. Rich Besser and Secretary Jay Johnson to the multi-state board and council that I, along with our region's governors, have established to help lead and coordinate our efforts regarding the eventual reopening 
of our states and economies. Dr. Besser on the left currently serves as the president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and is a former acting director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Jay Johnson served as the Secretary, the United States Secretary of Homeland Security under President Barack Obama. They will join, as I've mentioned, Chief of Staff George Helmy as our three representatives on the Regional Council. I thank them for their leadership. You know, we are blessed to have two folks like this in New Jersey to begin with, already in positions of authority in both the foundation and philanthropic world as well as in the private sector. And we're further blessed by their willingness to step up and serve. Uh, I've spoken to each of them over the past couple of days. There wasn't a moment of hesitation in either of their reactions to our, uh, our offer and our asking of them to help out. They will make a difference along with George and the other representatives from other states. They will make a real difference. And again, folks, there's sort of three rings of responsibility here. Number one, first and foremost, our responsibility to the nine million residents of New Jersey. That's job number one. The second ring out is coordination, exchanging of best ideas, harmonization with our regional neighbors. And then finally, it is a continuation of a strong cooperation with the federal government and the Trump administration, clearly working with members of Congress and leadership there. It is all of the above. It's not one versus the other. It's not one instead of the other. It's all of the above. And we could not have two better professionals, two better New Jerseyans, standing up on our regard than Rich Besser and Jay Johnson. So again, I thank them. Next, today I am pleased to announce that the board of the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Financing Authority has unanimously voted to suspend all rent increases at eligible properties within its entire portfolio. That's some 36,000 rental units across the state. This action specifically benefits thousands of low and moderate income families who have been among those most economically impacted by this emergency. I applaud the board for its action, and I also urge any resident whose ability to pay rent has been impacted due to the loss of a job to visit covid19.nj.gov and simply search for rent relief to be connected to available programs at the Department of Community Affairs. And again, I want to give Sheila Oliver, our Lieutenant Governor, who oversees the Department of Community Affairs and her team, a big shout out. Also this morning, the Department of Labor announced that the number of new, new unemployment claims over the past week has decreased mercifully by roughly one third from the week before. But we still have a record 429,000 residents currently receiving unemployment benefits and the number will continue to rise as new claims continue to be processed. As I announced a couple of days ago, the department has taken steps to significantly increase its capacity to review and approve unemployment claims. And I reiterate that regardless of when your claim is processed, no one will lose one penny of the benefits they deserve, including the additional $600 per week provided under the Federal CARES Act. To those of you trying to connect on the phone, we continue to ask for your patience as even with the expanded phone operations, there are still wait times given the overall volume of calls. If you have lost your job and can still work, please visit the jobs portal, portal again available at covid19.nj.gov. Uh, there you will find literally tens of thousands of jobs at hundreds of essential employers across the state and across an array of industries. And a reminder that anyone who has left their job voluntarily or who refuses to work at their currently available job is not eligible for unemployment. If I may switch gears again onto the subject of testing, of our two FEMA partnered testing sites, Bergen Community College will be open tomorrow, April 17th at 8 a.m. for a maximum of 500 tests. PNC Bank Arts Center will reopen Saturday April 18th exclusively for symptomatic first responders and healthcare workers. The PNC Bank Art Center site will reopen for the public at 8 a.m. on Monday, April 20th for 500 tests. And as I've noted, 
We have had days where the 500 test maximum has not been reached. So if you are symptomatic and qualify for a test, make Homedale your first stop. There are now two dozen publicly accessible testing sites across the state that are open to residents of specific counties and which are listed on our information hub at covid19.nj.gov slash testing. Additionally, there are roughly 40 more, 40 more privately run sites that your primary care practitioner can send you if you meet the requirements for testing. As I've said for the past couple of days, it's at least 66 sites in total. And I, as I have noted, we recognize that significantly expanding testing is critical and necessary for us as we move forward. I continue to press this case in my conversations with the White House and our other federal partners, both on my own and alongside our, all of our governors. Each state is experiencing a shortage of tests. This isn't unique to New Jersey. In fact, we're punching well above our weight. But if you're waiting for a test and you're in your car and you're frustrated, I don't blame you. We need to get more testing materials to New Jersey. Uh, but I'm committed, I will tell you, to continuing to get us the testing supplies and innovations that we need. And speaking of getting all that we need, last week we opened a volunteer portal for those with experience in computer programming and other technological areas. We have been overwhelmed by the response with more than 2,800 people stepping forward. I'm happy to say this is one area where we now have more volunteers than we need. Uh, our team is currently going through the list of, of all of you and each of you who have provided your information, and you will be informed, I hope sooner than later, if there is a match. Next, I want to acknowledge one of our state's corporate leaders that is stepping up despite facing their own unique challenges. Wakefern Foods operates ShopRite stores across North Jersey and Central Jersey and in eight other states. They have emerged as a central player on the front lines of our work to keep our state running despite issues of supply and demand and their effort to keep their workforce state safe, rather. But in the face of all this, they aren't forgetting those in need and recently announced a $1 million donation to support the food banks in the communities it serves. Thank you, Wakefern Foods, for your partnership and support of our residents. And this is a good transition to highlight, as I always say every day, good news stories that come across uh, our state. And today, we've got one in particular that I want to get to. I want to give a huge shout out to two nurses. Let's get them up there. There they are at RWJ Barnabas Community Health Center in Toms River. Here are ICU nurse Christine Warren on the left, signaling a touchdown apparently, and emergency department nurse Mary Ellen Jakubowski on the right. They both had contracted COVID-19. Both were treated at Community Medical Center and last Friday, they both were discharged after defeating the virus. Here they are after being clapped out of the hospital by their colleagues. God bless them. If you get a chance to see the video of this moment, it is nothing short of emotional. It does violate social distancing. Uh, and I have to remember, Judy will kill me if I don't say the fact that just because we're wearing masks, as we all do now, um, we're only taking these off so you can understand us, that does not trump social distancing. Social distancing, saying six feet away, trumps all, but it is still emotional nonetheless. Both Christine and Mary Ellen put human faces to the fact that our frontline health professionals are heroes. They are selflessly putting their own safety at risk to serve others. We wish them all the best, and we will never forget. At every RWJ Barnabas Hospital, at St. Clair's in Denville, and at St. Peter's in New Brunswick, whenever someone defeats COVID-19 and is discharged, they play the Beatles, Here Comes the Sun, over the PA system, to alert everyone that another victory has been won. I'm reminded of the line in that song, the smiles returning to the faces. We will all get there. Each and every single one of us is equally essential in flattening the curve and getting ourselves to the point where we can responsibly begin to reopen our state. Keep up with your social distancing, please. Stay at home. Keep wearing your face coverings, even though it may be a nuisance, and even if you think you look silly. Trust me, you don't, and you'll look far sillier if you have to trade in a face covering for a hospital gown. 
we will get through this unequivocally, not without cost. Look at the lives, the thousands now of lives we've lost. But we will, New Jersey, get through this together as one extraordinary family, stronger than ever before. The sun is coming, I promise you. With that, I'll turn things over to the person who needs no introduction. Please help me welcome the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> In my daily reports, I usually provide you with information on the health impacts of COVID-19. Um, however, we cannot overlook the mental health impacts this pandemic is having on all of us. Uh, the disruption of our daily routines can cause stress and economic, and the economic realities of being out of work can be overwhelming. Uh, social separation is key to fighting this virus, but it also is keeping us from the direct contact and support of those we depend on. We are dealing with new stressors in our everyday lives. Uh, being in our homes alone, perhaps, for extended periods of time, or having to balance, balance working from home with helping children with their homeschooling, or worrying about potential exposure as you do your work as an essential employee. So these are certainly extraordinary times, and they come with novel new worries and anxieties. So to help New Jerseyans in managing these stressors, I want to remind you that our colleagues at the Department of Human Services launched the New Jersey Mental Health Cares Hotline at 866-202-HELP or 866-202-4357. Specialists are available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. It's an opportunity to have a safe space to talk and get support and care in these challenging times. We encourage you to reach out. Human Services has also partnered with Access of St. Joseph's Health in Patterson to create free support helpline for individuals who are hearing impaired. Individuals can call 973-870 0677 Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. In addition, in response to the governor's directive, Human Services, Banking and Insurance, and the Department of Health have worked to promote access to mental health care during these difficult times, including increasing telemental health. Medicaid, in particular, has taken unprecedented steps to make telemental health easier to access and easier for healthcare providers to offer. We are working across New Jersey government to connect residents to coverage. Folks in need of health coverage uh, should visit uh, getcovered.nj.gov to learn more about the marketplace and Medicaid coverage. We believe that coverage means not just coverage for physical health, but coverage for physical and mental health, and also substance use disorders. As always, those struggling with substance use disorder should call Human Services free 24-hour hotline at 844-REACH-NEW-JERSEY to connect to treatment. On behalf of our colleagues at Human Services and myself, a special thank you to the mental health and substance use disorder counselors, therapists, and peers, and others who are making sure this care is available. During these times, it's important for everyone to practice self-care. Take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, including social media. Connect with families and friends through video chat or by phone. Try to stick to a routine as much as possible. Exercise, eat healthy meals, try to get some sleep. If you're able to, continue working from home. A recent study has shown that adults that continue to work reported better mental and physical health than those who stop working. Call your health care provider if stress gets in the way of your daily activities for several days in a row. While we fight hard to protect your physical health, Let's be sure to focus just as intently on our mental health and mental well-being. 
Last evening, our hospitals reported 8,224 hospitalizations uh, with uh, individuals uh, uh, having COVID-19 and those under investigation. The daily growth rate was flat. Since March 31st, as reported, we've discharged over 8,000 individuals. There are now 2,014 individuals in critical care. 1,645 of those individuals are on ventilators. That's 82% of our intensive care patients are on ventilators. You may recall a number of days ago that was as high as 97%. There are 379 long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities now reporting uh, at least one COVID-19 in their facilities. For over 8,000 and 2,009 cases being reported in our long-term care facilities. As I reported, these facilities are taking care of our most vulnerable populations and they are particular, particularly at risk for COVID-19 complications. Uh, that's why the department has been focused on these facilities and since March 6 we've issued 18 orders and guidances. I'd like to give you a little more information about the Andover facility. The Andover facility uh, is the largest long-term care facility in the state. They're licensed for 514 long-term care beds in one building and 159 in another building. As of the 15th, the census was 120 in Andover 1 and 419 in Andover 2. Last Saturday, we were notified uh, that the facility was in need of body bags for deceased residents. And it was also reported that there were 28 bodies being stored in that facility. We immediately notified the local health department and the public health nurse and the local health officer visited that f facility at 2 a.m. Sunday morning. You may recall I shared a number of days ago that we had sent out a team. They surveyed the facility and reported back that there was appropriate staffing and PPE at that time. Additionally, they reported that they observed five bodies on site and the staff reported to them that three bodies had been released earlier in the day. At that point, we required the facility to report daily to the local health department. We also sent them additional PPE and the names of individuals that they could call up if they needed additional staffing. The facility was required to institute their backup plan for storage of deceased at the local hospital. On the 14th, we received another complaint that more bodies were being stored. At 3 p.m. on the 14th, the local health department surveyed the facility and reported that they were short on staffing. And we additionally called up the owner of the facility and notified him of our concerns and required him to report back to, her, to us. We will be sending survey staff out to monitor the activities of this facility on a regular basis. This morning, the owner of the facility reported to me that the current staffing is solid with 12 nurses, normal is 11, and 39 CNAs, their normal is 40. Additional administrative personnel are now on site and they have provided for additional wages to be paid for CNAs to incent them to work at the facility. The census today is 420 of 543. We're not pleased with what is going on at the Andover facility and I will give you a full report of their statistics. 19 residents have been reported as positive for COVID-19, two are hospitalized. 34 residents have been identified as having flu-like symptoms. There have been seven total deaths since the third, 
since April 3rd. Five of the deaths have been due to COVID-19, and they also report four staff members with flu-like symptoms. And over two, which has a census of 419, they report 84 residents with COVID-19 positive. An additional 99 are showing respiratory symptoms. 48 staff are reporting flu-like symptoms. There have been 28 deaths since the March 30th. 14 of those deaths have been due to COVID-19. We continue to work with all of the local health uh, officials who are monitoring long-term care facilities that have COVID-19 cases. And our department's communicable disease experts provide support to those local health departments as they respond to these outbreaks. As the governor reported, today we are reporting 4,391 new cases for a total of 75,317 cases in our state. And sadly, we're reporting 362 new deaths, of which 54 were residents of long-term care facilities. We now have a total of 3,518 deaths in the state. Of the deaths that we have information on, 43% are female, 57% are male. 51.1% are white, non-Hispanic. 22.5% are black, non-Hispanic. 15.5% are Hispanic, 5.5% Asian, and 5.4% are identified as other. We continue to see the underlying condi conditions of cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, other chronic diseases, other lung diseases, and renal disease, uh, along with neurological disability and cancer as the leading causes of comorbid complications. According to uh, data from this morning, uh, seven laboratories sending us COVID-19 results report that 138,609 individuals have been tested, 62,096 have returned positive with a holding positivity rate of 44.8%. Uh, Again, in closing, I remind everyone to take steps to protect their mental health throughout this outbreak. This is a difficult time for all of us. Be patient and be kind to one another and stay connected. Thank you. Judy, thank you. A couple of quick follow-up items just to say, as we normally do, the top six counties continue to be the ones that we've been reporting on. Bergen followed by Hudson, Essex, Union, Passaic, and Middlesex in terms of number of cases. Secondly, the African-American number continues to be a particular concern for us in terms of the uh, uh, continues to be 50 plus percent larger or uh, higher rather than the representation overall uh, in the African-American community in this state and that's something we continue to be very focused on. I've not yet acknowledged, but I want to acknowledge Jared Maples, the Director of the Department of Homeland Security and Preparedness, and Deputy Counsel Paramount Garg, who are with us today. Thank you. Also, I, I meant to say earlier, uh, we had a leadership meeting this morning uh, to sort of update as best we can, and this is very general terms on uh, particularly some of the financial implications of this crisis uh, on the state, uh, both revenues, expenses, status of federal monies, et cetera. Uh, with the Senate President, the Speaker, and their respective majority leaders and uh, budget chairs. Uh, I also had a uh, conversation just before coming in, which is partly why I'm a couple minutes late with Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, and he and I and his office and mine are in constant uh, discussions, and again, repeating the plea that I've made many times from this table. Uh, while the CARES Act was a very good step in the right direction, we need a lot more direct federal cash assistance uh, into states, and I'll raise my hand specific, specifically into New Jersey. The National Governors Association has put forth an ask of $500 billion 
I've said to you before that uh, I won't speak for the other governors, but our assessment uh, was a few weeks ago that New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut needed $100 billion. We put that in, in a letter of the four governors. I think that number, if anything, is closer to $150 billion direct cash assistance, uh, and there's just no way around that. We can't continue to be at the front lines serving those who have health care, if not life and death challenges, folks who have lost their jobs, small businesses, uh, hospital systems, transit systems, and the like, unless we get the federal money to back and fill our efforts. So just to reiterate that. With that, with an update on compliance, PPE, other matters, please help me welcome another indispensable figure in this fight, Colonel Pat Callahan. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, very briefly, with regards to the overnight compliance in Mount Olive, up in Morris County, a subject was cited for violation of a temporary restraining order, and the EO violation was subsequently lodged in the Morris County Jail. Newark Police Department issued 72 EO violation summonses and closed one business. In Washington Township, Warren County, two individuals were cited for maintaining a public nuisance uh, and also cited for the EO violations. In Mount Ephraim, as a result of an overturned uh, vehicle in a motor vehicle accident, that subject was charged uh, with an EO violation. In Atlantic City, police responded to the call of a shoplifter at a CVS, uh, and in processing that subject, um, he coughed on officers claiming that he had the coronavirus. Uh, in Pensalkin, police responded to an alarm at a Foreman Mills location where inside they did locate the subject who had uh, allegedly broken into that facility. Uh, he was charged with uh, multiple charges associated with the burglary as well as the EO violation. Uh, in Cherry Hill, uh, police responded to the report that the employees there preparing food were not wearing the face coverings uh, as uh, mandated in, in the EO and they were cited uh, for not having the coverings on. In Jersey City, after three days in a row of offering warnings at a supermarket, uh, police cited two individuals who worked there for failure to wear the proper uh, face coverings. Um, Union City, at a, well, that was in Union City, excuse me, in Jersey City, there was a subject that was being arrested uh, at a harassment charge and uh, started coughing on the officers, saying, uh, if I'm going to die, you are going to die with me. Um, and that's it. And with regard to PPE, that is an, an hourly uh, effort, Governor, whether it's ventilators, gowns seem to have risen to the top of the list now, masks. Uh, I was happy to come home last night to find approximately uh, 200 R95 masks on my front porch from a neighbor who's in construction. So that level of uh, donation and dedication is appreciated. So I thank uh, my neighbor, George, for that. That's all, Governor. Here's to your neighbor, George. We've we <laughs> got to get his picture up here at some point. So hold that thought. Thank you, Pat. And again, to the knuckle, the members of the Knucklehead Hall of Shame, uh, it, it just is beyond comprehension why people would do that, but they apparently continue to do that. And it's one thing to not have a face covering, although that's inexcusable, but it's another thing to proactively and aggressively try to infect somebody else, which is completely unacceptable. Again, everybody watching, everybody out there, the overwhelming amount of you all and all of us are doing the right thing and rowing the boat together and doing the things that we need to do. Uh, and that map wouldn't look as it looks uh, earlier without the extraordinary efforts. And again, on the school front, um, w w I've said at least until May 15th, I would be the happiest guy in New Jersey, maybe America, if not the planet, to be able to have a very different message then. I've gotten a lot of incomings from parents of kids who are particularly sports-oriented, uh, not surprisingly, of seniors in high school, uh, whether it's related to sports, academics, seeing their friends, graduation ceremonies, I have nothing but complete sympathy. Please know that we're not in any way, shape, or form uh, trying to be um, uh, a doctor no here. Uh, nothing would give me more joy than to be able to say we're ready to go, but we're just not there. If we all continue to stay the course for the next four weeks, I guess May 15th is four weeks from tomorrow, we may well have a different message at that point. It's up to all of us to stay at it. Please, God, stay at it. Stay home. Stay away from each other. Let's hope for better news. With that, we're going to sweep across once and only once. John, we'll begin with you. 
Uh, John, I noticed that you're moving your chair every day. I may, I may shift up the, where we start the sweep. I'm only doing this for Dave, only because we, we, we uh, uh, no, that's not true. But. Uh, two quick questions on schools. Um, uh, can, can you get that microphone closer? Thank sorry. you. Sorry. Uh, Dante's got the on mic. On schools, two quick questions. The orders, it, does it again include private and non-public schools? Uh, the May 15th date, does that telegraph anything about the rest of the state opening up? Uh, at that time or the possibility that would be the date. On long-term care, was Andover one, were you receiving complaints about Andover not notifying families of illnesses or death? Uh, any complaints generally about Andover in the recent weeks since the COVID-19 breakout? What other long-term care facilities have you visited and can you tell us what actions were done there? Any specifics you can tell us about these, these places? And can you define in the order uh, investigation, what's a disproportion number of COVID deaths at a long-term care facility? Would say 33 out of 100 be disproportionate, which is a report of one care facility we're hearing about now. And can you also, there's a lot of reports of refrigerated trucks being used to store bodies. Can you tell us what specific regulations, what rules are in place to handle bodies in refrigerated trucks, what supervision's being done for that. And Governor... One, one more, John. Yeah. We asked before about naming these places. You said you wouldn't because of privacy, and that's clearly the end over one. At what point will you name these places to let people know what is going on in these, where dozens of people are dying or disposing bodies in parking lots? Yep. Will you name these so parents, people can know what's happening to their parents and loved ones? Yep. Okay, um, let me start, Judy, and turn to you. And, and Pat, we may want you to come in on ref the refrigerator trucks. It is Paramount All Schools, uh, number one. That's the most important thing. And secondly, May 15th, I wouldn't read a whole lot into it. Um, we're trying to make this, we're trying to balance a lot of different plates in the air, as you can imagine. First and foremost, input from the woman to my right and, and the guy to her right in terms of the health uh, inputs and the data related to health, most importantly. Um, four weeks from tomorrow, uh, to us, feels like we can get to a uh, sort of a, a halfway, uh, if you will. It's, again, it's at least to May 15th. Um, it's a window that we, we collectively, along with the Commissioner of the Department of Education, feel is a comfortable enough window for us to be able to give one more shot to reassess, at least one more shot, but, but to reassess. Um, I'm just going to make one general comment. You can imagine the reaction I had or any of us had uh, when the stories, the story has come to light on this uh, subacute uh, uh, rehabilitation centers. I mean, this is just completely beyond the pale. It's not just, unfortunately, I wish it was just saying, you know, that this was a narrow issue. This is a, a national challenge for us right now, but completely unacceptable. Um, I'm going to ask Judy to, to come in. Uh, on the specific questions to Andover and the broader long-term care facilities. And then, Pat, you may want to come back in after that as it relates to the re refrigerated trucks question. Judy? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to share with you um, a, an excerpt from the uh, investigation uh, that was, uh, was done at Andover. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it gives you an indication of how organizations, facilities are trying to comply. Um, this is... Uh, a table within the lobby had instructions for all staff take their temperature and complete a screening questionnaire. A notice was displayed at the main entrance. The notice provided current statistics of positive COVID-19 staff and residents within the facility. Information regard regarding quarantine of residents and assignment of staff was provided by the charge nurse and the medical assistant. That gives you an idea of how they're complying and how we check on what's going on. We rely on the local health officers uh, for, to visit facilities when we get uh, lower level complaints. If we get immediate jeopardy complaints, we, our survey team goes out or CMS um, uh, goes out, the federal uh, surveyors. Uh, I cannot tell you how many have been visited. I do know that we have not received what we would call IJ complaints during this particular pandemic. Uh, that does not mean uh, that there are not immediate jeopardy issues. It means that we have not received the complaints. Um, 
I'll let uh, Pat talk about the, refriger uh, the refrigerated uh, trucks because we have uh, ordered them through the medical examiner. Before Pat answers, I, di I didn't answer your question. I'm going to leave it to the Attorney General on the question of disproportionate. But the numbers you cited, uh, John, uh, would certainly, personal litmus tests would certainly pass that bar. Thank you. And Paramel, you'll follow up with the, with the General. Pat. Yes, we do have a, um, and have in every disaster, have a mortuary affairs or mass casualty component built in, John. Uh, we did, I think we even announced it a few weeks ago, we had ordered 20 several weeks ago refrigerated trailers.